Welcome to class. <laughs> all right. How y'all feeling this morning? Sound good? Choir. Thank y'all so much. Y'all been on fire from work go this morning. The kid dancers, thank y'all. Worship leaders, musicians. Now, in your bulletin, it says this is the teaching hour. I promise you I will not be an hour. Not like I got a team to go home to watch this afternoon, but... Hey, man. Hey, this is real. Kirk still is not my cousin. All right. So, we're going to get into this. Today, our topic is the Bible. Is it a mixtape or is it a concept album? How many of y'all know what a mixtape is? You know, know what a concept album is? Uh, <laughs> all right, we're going to get into it. First, if you have any questions, we're going to do something different this time around, okay? If, uh, if I'm able to, uh, I'll uh, start to answer some questions at the end. But you can text in any question you have to 22333. And to join in, you have to put in Richard John's 871, and then you're going to get a message back that says you're into the poll. Once you get that, then you can send in any questions you have about anything I'm saying. Your, all your questions are anonymous, so if you say something mean, I won't know who said it, so I can't beat you up later. But either way, you can text in anything anonymous, and uh, if I'm not able to get to it at the end of the message, I will definitely respond tonight via Facebook, okay? One of those live videos. All right, let us pray before we get started. Eternal God, our Father, we just thank you for this day, God. We just thank you for everything that we have experienced so far in your presence we thank you for your, your spirit being here in this place, God. God, I pray that you just bless this hour of teaching, God. You bless the, the time that we spend together, God. Please bless the congregation. I pray that you open their, their ears and their minds and they're able to receive what it is that you want to share, God. And I pray that you, you just move me out of the way, God. Just allow me to teach your word and to teach what you have given to me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all ready? You're going to have to talk to me a little bit, okay, because this, this ain't straight preaching, so it's teaching. So if I ask a question, you got to respond, okay? Are you ready? Yeah. There we go. Okay, cool. All right. Now, Miss Erica, when she got started with, um, when we started doing the revamp for the fourth Sunday, she said that she wanted us to go into teaching Bible lessons, teaching Bible characters. So I'm like, okay, cool. You know, I like that. I love teaching right up my alley. Cool. All right. So... Before we get into that, uh, before I just jump right into Garden of Eden or anything like that, I wanted to get into an overview period about the Bible itself, okay? So before, like I said, we get into any individual stories, today our focus is just strictly on the Bible as it stands, okay? Cool. All right, now, let's ask, how much do you read your Bible? This ain't a question you text in. This is, <laughs> this is one right in here. <laughs> if you want to close your eyes to make it an anonymous text, we can do that too. <laughs> Who reads their Bibles every single day? I'm, in the morning, I'm reading. At night, I'm reading. You can be honest. I'm not, I don't judge anybody. It's all good. All right. How many of y'all, I read it once a week? <laughs> once a week. I'm at, how many of y'all, I'm at Bible study. I read it one of my Bible study. How about I only read that little scripture that comes through my app? And that's what I post on Instagram. How many don't even crack that open, only read what's on the screen whenever Pastor K about to preach? Don't answer. All right, so when talking about the Bible, the Bible is the best seller of all time. The Bible, okay? It's one of the greatest books ever written, but it's also one of the misunderstood books ever written. So today, we're going to get into ways to kind of understand the Bible. So let's talk about the Bible. When looking at the Bible, when, when trying to make sense of it, when trying to read through, there is really, in the way I kind of broke it down, and what I think will work for today, while we got the music being going on, there's two types of approaches, I think, when trying to 
read the Bible, okay? We're trying to make sense of the Bible. There is approach one, the mixtape approach. We're going to get into that uh, a little bit later about what exactly the mixtape approach is. Then also we're going to get into approach number two, the concept album approach. Now, one is not better than the other. One is a type that I think all of us tend to do. And the second one is one that I think sometimes gets neglected or isn't always paid attention to. Make sense? Cool. All right. So where are my music fans in the house? Y'all was just shouting and singing with Kevin. Now you're going to act like y'all are music fans. That, really? That's what we're doing? Okay. My music fans. How many people know what a mixtape is? A mixtape, or for some of my later babies, a mixed CD. Same concept of a mixtape, okay? What's a mixtape? It's stuff that you put together. It's just a compilation of a whole bunch of works. There's, there's two types of mixtapes. There's the one for, for my, my, my real 90s babies, not the ones that were born in the 90s, but the one that grew up in the 90s. The real mixtapes is when you used to get that little blank Maxwell tape. <laughs> throw it into your tape player. With 95.5, come on. Non-stop jams, record. <laughs> or if you were slick and you was tired of listening to that H-Town tape, you get that little piece of scotch tape that you put over top of the opening. <laughs> or y'all ain't know how to bootleg. Uh, that little piece of scotch tape, you put it on, that way you can, you can dub over a, a commercial tape. But we don't do that anymore because we're saved. But yes, <laughs> you can throw that in, that can be your blank tape, and you can make a mix. And back in the day, you can make a mix about anything you wanted. You can make a mix about any type of mood you want. You can make your, your date mix. If you're ready to go out on a date or you're getting ready for a date, you got your mix of all your slow jams. That's when you got your, your Mary J. Blige and your Bethan Man, you're all I need to get by. This is what you need. If it's a girl that you're trying to get back, that's when you get your boys to men, like, end of the road. <laughs> your Drew Hill, we was five steps. <laughs> but you cut me off at three. Yeah. Or, back in the day, so that's one type of mixtape, okay? That's the kind that you put together, all right? The kind that you dub. The kind that you basically pirated music for. So either way. But then there's also the commercial type. Back in the day, MCs used to put out their own mixtapes. Why? Because record companies weren't coming to see Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick once upon a time. For my 80s babies. <laughs> they weren't coming to see Melly Mel and Dana Dane and Grandmaster Flash, <laughs> or the group that sings Sally Walks. <laughs> Can't remember their name. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> so DJs and MCs used to make their own mixtapes. They would make their own collection of stuff. And it would be live stuff, and they would just put it out there and sell it out the trunk of the car, sell it before shows, and that's what they did. Nowadays now, you don't so much get as much of that. Now you get a whole bunch of these young hoppers that make their own. Wow, I'm sounding old. I said young hoppers. <laughs> Woo! You get some of these young cats. <laughs> some of these young bucks <laughs> who make up their own mixtapes. They put together their own Mix of music, like Chance Rapper. Any Chance fans in here? That's what I'm talking about. So they would do their own stuff. So a mixtape is just a collection of songs. It's a collection of whatever they put out. There's no full-on production value. There's no producer to it. It's whatever I'm going to put on this tape, that's what I'm going to put out, OK? Whatever message I'm going to gather is what I'm going to put out. So. How does that work for the Bible? How does that work as a biblical approach? How some people look at the Bible as a mixtape? Well, for some folks, they look at each individual Bible story as its own individual music track. For example,
for those, my cats, they said they used to make their own mixtapes mix off of the radio. Did you have a mixtape of all the same artists? No, you didn't have an all mixtape of just nothing but Drew Hill stuff. You had a mixtape of whatever you wanted. That's how it is for how some people may view or may study the Bible. I'm just going to look at and pick out what I want or what I like or what makes sense to me and not look at the whole exact deal. No exact flow, but I'm picking out what resonates with me. It's not a bad thing. I'm just pointing out the difference, okay? There are some folks that will only, I'm only going to read the Psalms because this works for me. I'm only going to read this gospel because it works for me. I'm not going to touch Revelation because it scares the mess out of me. You understand what I'm saying? Cool. So there are certain things that we will pull out together and, and we'll keep together, all right? Now, let me ask this. I'm sorry, before I ask this. So the thing also about looking at the Bible as a mixtape is you can read the Bible stories and you can learn the moral of each story individually, okay? So what you end up with is a stack of lessons, and we'll get into that in a sec, a stack of lessons that you'll get from reading each individual story, all right? And you obtain layers, as we said, of morals and not the whole album. So the story of David will give you a different lesson from possibly the story of Nehemiah, or the story of Nehemiah will give you a different lesson from the story of Jonah instead of one big story, even though it's all in the same book. Make sense? Cool. I know y'all don't like when I say make sense, but I'm teaching right now, so I'm going to say it a whole lot. Cool? Thank you. So when you have individual stories, individual mixed tracks, if you look at a mixed track of Noah and the Ark, you may learn that God always provides. If you have a mixed track and look at uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you may get the, uh, the lesson that God will always be there in your time of trial. David and Goliath, giants do fall. Queen Esther, which JR preached so nicely a, a couple, couple months ago, and that is God can put you at the right position at the right time for the right situation. So you get a stack of lessons when you look at the Bible as a mixtape. All right? We cool with that? All right, now let's pivot over to a concept album. Who knows what a concept album is? Just raise your hands. Raise your hands high because I can't see that well. Cool. All right. A concept album. A concept album is a series of songs that either tell one whole story or speak to one main theme. Now, let's see some examples. How many Kendrick Lamar fans? Kendrick Lamar, Gig, Good Kid, Mad City. One of my favorite albums of all time. Did y'all know that's a concept album for my Kendrick fans? It's telling a story from start to finish. It's telling the story about, it's, it's actually one day in the life of Kendrick. It's one day in, in Compton where he's trying to meet up with a girl. He gets jacked by her cousins who are game bangers. Him and his boys retaliate. It's a big gang fight. Dudes get shot on both sides, and Kendrick gets tired of the violence, and he actually gives his life to Christ at the end of the album. Oh, yeah. That's... That's telling a whole story. Every song relates back to that story. How many of y'all was glued to your TV when R. Kelly came out with Trapped in the Closet? I only made it to the first four. I couldn't make it no more after that. I'm like, what, midgets? What happened? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what, somebody's in the trailer? What? <laughs> That's different. I thought it was just a preacher that was cheating on his wife with a, okay. No, yeah, R. Kelly made a whole concept album based around I don't know what, but we was all watching for a while until you had to tap out like I did. So I can't, I can't do this no more. I, I got to get the rest of my life back. All right, now I know I talked about two new things. All right, so for my old school folks, I won't just call you old. I'll say old school. How many of y'all are Marvin Gaye fans? And Marvin Gaye's best album of all time was? Let's get it on. Let's get it on. <laughs> Whoever didn't say. <laughs> and y'all talk about the kids. They said, let's get it on. Did y'all hear that too? Because I know I heard that. One of the best albums of all time is What's Going On. And that's, that's what you were saying, and I just heard you wrong. So what's going on is one of his best albums. 
one, one of his hottest tracks of all time, just the, the, the title track, What's Going On. But the deal is this, is what's going on is actually telling a bigger story than just that one song. When you listen to the whole album, it's actually all of the, the, the musings or the thoughts or the thought process of a man who's returned home from Vietnam. It's a deeper story than just that song or, you know, Mercy, Mercy Me or Make Me Wanna Holler. If you want to feel the whole impact of the album, you got to listen to it from top to bottom. You got to see a man who just got home from Vietnam from a, from a war-torn area and seeing all kinds of horrors and atrocities who gets home to see in America now, blacks, whites, that's ever protesting against the government, all of them are getting beat down. Now I'm asking the question, I was just fighting a war, now I'm coming back home to another war. And as he keeps on going, he's seeing that the environment is wrecked up. That we <laughs> It was wrecked up in the, in the 60s, 70s, so God only knows what Marvin Gaye would say right now. So either way, I, see, I come home, I see the environment is, is being wrecked. I see that little kids are not being taken care of. And now I'm getting to the point where it just says, makes me want to holler, throw up both my hands. That song, when you hear that last track, it hits you with a whole nother weight once you've gone through the whole journey with him to see how he's gotten to that point where he just wants to holler. Sorry, kids, I was telling the old folks that time. The, the, sorry, the old school folks that time. But y'all feel what I'm saying? Cool? Vintage. I'm sorry, vintage. You're right. My CD folks or my MP3 folks or my record folks. <laughs> my vinyl folks. Okay. So, with a concept album, with looking at the Bible as a concept album, so we understand mixtape, you have a mix of stories, you have layers of lessons, right? Concept album, there's some of the differences. The songs are okay on their own. They're not bad, they're fine on their own. But it takes on a whole greater meaning when you understand the full context of what's being said. Every song and every story fits to tell one larger story. So let's look at it. Let's, let's look at the breakdown, okay? As a mixtape, the Bible stands on its own. You can gain a collection of morals, a collection of lessons, a collection of stories. With the concept album, all the stories connect. All, there is one main point that's, that's being told. So which one? is the Bible. Mixtape, concept album, both, both, it, yes, no, maybe so. It's kind of up to your interpretation, but let's look at the scripture. Yes, I do have scripture. All right, Luke 24, 44 through 49. You don't have to stand, you can stay where you are. And where it says this, this is Jesus after he's resurrected and he's talking to his disciples. This is Jesus talking now, and he says, Then he, Jesus said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said, Yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed and the authority of his name to all nations begin, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness. Somebody say forgiveness. Of, all, of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses to this thing. So let's look at what Jesus just said. He said he, he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. And he says that, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead. On the third day, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed. But then, let me go back to the key verse, though, 44, where it says, when I was with you before, I told you that everything, everything in the first half of this was written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets. That's talking about Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, everything was written about me in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. So what kind of approach is Jesus kind of using? Is he using a mixtape or is he using a concept? Why? Because it's all about him. Very good. Y'all are learning very well. All right. 
So when looking at the Bible as a concept album, um, I'm going to need you to, to put on your imaginations with me, okay? Because we understand the basic story of, of Jesus, that you know, he was sent by God, he came, he died, he fulfilled the scriptures, he resurrected. But I want you to look at it in a slightly more, slightly different way, okay? Y'all going to work with me? You promise? Okay. When looking at what concept album can we really, I guess, compare the Bible to, uh, what's a concept album where I can see this visual example and I can see how it can work in biblical life? So, when I was thinking, and I'm, I'm don't, don't text this question to me, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it came from God because it wasn't my own thought. But when I was looking at, okay, God, what, what concept album can I share with, with First Christian that's going to kind of equate to what I'm trying to say here? So for all of my fans, when it really hit me, it's like the Bible is like, the Bible is kind of like lemonade. Now, before you all start saying I'm Illuminati and that Beyonce is the Antichrist and all that kind of stuff, just hold on, just hold on a second. Okay. Let me look at it. I said, really? Lem lemonade? Think about it. I'm like, okay. Overall, what's, what's the story of lemonade kind of telling? Don't answer, just think about it. For those, how many of you people have heard of lemonade? Let me just start right there. And before you judge me, before you start posting some stuff out on Facebook, I'm saying this, I know lemonade because I have a little sister. I just need that to be clear. <laughs> All right. So, no, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a stand myself or part of the beehive or whatever. But either way, I'm like, huh. The Bible understood the eliminated. I'm like, all right, God, you got to break it down to me. So I really started listening to the album. I mean, just, you know, listening, everything shut off, just really concentrating on what she was saying and what's the story that's being told. And when, when I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, okay, I can kind of see it. So let me help you see what I saw, okay? You're going to work with me? You promise? You promise? Okay. So where's my Beyonce at? <laughs> okay, cool. When you look at the story of Lemonade or the story that Beyonce is telling, it's a story of a relationship that got broken. There was a falling between two lovers. And it's all a process to try to work back to restoration. So I'm like, okay, I, I get the overall story now. Help me make more sense of it. So when I looked at it, I'm like, huh. The opening song kind of mind me of the Garden of Eden a little bit. Go ahead, Beyonce. Pray to catch you whispering. I pray you catch me listening. God caught Adam and Eve I'm listening. Praying to catch you whispering. Whispering to the snake in the garden. I'm praying to catch me. I'm praying to catch you whispering. God was in a perfect union with Adam and Eve. Listening. Until somebody interrupted that relationship catch me. and started whispering in both of their ears. You follow what I'm saying? I said, okay. Huh. So God is saying, pray to catch me whispering because that song is all about there's something going on. I know something is not right. And I'm hoping I catch you in the midst of this. And when you look at Genesis... When Adam and Eve were in the garden, we're going to talk about the garden next month. They were in perfect union with God. God walked with them, talked with them. I mean, talked directly. We pray sometimes and don't hear nothing back. We want to God with you. Well, once upon a time, it used to be different. God was in perfect communication, and all of a sudden, somebody else started kind of whispering in Eve's ear. And then she started whispering in Adam's ear. Then all of a sudden, we whispering in each other's ears, and we no longer, we're not talking to God anymore. And then what happened? God is just 
going right through the bushes, walking right through the garden. It's like, Adam, where you at? Eve, where you at? And there's an issue. That's when the breaking of relationship starts to take place. When they have someone come in the garden to interrupt their happy union, their happy relationship. And even though it doesn't stay quite messed up, God got angry, yes, but God still is God, and God still loves, and God still try to work out the situation. And we're moving on from Adam and Eve, and we're looking at when humankind started developing within the Bible, when the other scriptures started coming up, and we started seeing what else men and women were doing within the Bible. And if you get to, like, the Exodus story, even, especially, God has done an amazing thing for them. He didn't deliver them out of Egypt. He didn't brought them out of bondage. He heard their prayers. And then one of the biggest slaps in the face they gave God after they got out, as you continue in the story of the Bible, is that God delivered them, and then they forget or start to ignore who did the work for them. It's kind of a nasty story, ain't it? That's a... That's, that's a that's a slap. When you think about it, when you really look at the story and you see how God worked for these people, delivered these people, and all of a sudden they forget. It's kind of a slap to us, too, because we can take this to apply to our own selves when God does so much to work for us, and all of a sudden we forget. He done brought us out of bondage, but then sometimes we forget. <laughs> he brought us out of bondage, and the pastor came when I have a 5 o'clock serving, all of a sudden we don't want to be there because we forget. And that's when God has to give that reminder. <laughs> Where are Beyonce at? Sorry. That's when you get that reminder about, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to remember who I am. You got to remember what I did for you. You got to remember that don't nobody love you like I love you. Hold up. They don't love you like I love you. Slow down. They don't love you like I love you. Back up. They don't love you like I love you. Step down. They don't love you like I love you. God had to send that reminder. <laughs> and he sends that reminder all throughout the scriptures. The gods that you're serving or the things that you're doing, these things don't love you the way I love you. God is gracious. God is merciful. God is forgiven. But there is a time limit to what you can do. He's plenty of grace. I don't know how long his grace goes. They say from as far as the east from the west, he separates us from our sin. But there is still a point where he's like, okay, you know what? I've had a little bit enough. I'm not going to have her sing it because I couldn't get the words, but <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't edit them. But there is a point, especially if y'all watch the Lemonade, it was like, hold on. <laughs> Don't play yourself. Don't hurt yourself. You better love God, in this case, himself. And that's the arc of what the story is telling. It's like, you hurt me. I know something's amiss. I need you to understand, don't nobody love you the way I love you. Now I'm at this point where you're not receiving that, so I'm going to have to tell you, you know what, guess what, pack up all your stuff, boy. <laughs> God, at least now, seems like he doesn't always tell us to pack up our stuff, but this time the God just sits back and says, you know what, okay, you know what, do you. And swing, it swings, you're right, it swings his legs. Do you? Let's see what happens. Do you? Do what you want to do. Sorry, I'm at a little de technical difficulty. But how many of y'all know the story doesn't end with God just telling you to do you? You can witness at this part. The story does not end with God just telling you just to do you, and I'm not going to have anything else to do with you. There does come restoration. There does come redemption. There does come 
of repairing of the broken relationship. So I'm like, huh, okay. I kind of see what you're cooking, God. All right, how lemonade could work. Understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying Beyonce is God. I'm not saying Jay-Z is, I'm, I'm just saying see the connection. It's a common story, and that's the story that the whole Bible is telling. There is a break. There is a hard period of trying to get back together. And there is a restorative part where it starts to come back together. So let's, let's look at this. Let's look at it. the Bible more so as a, as a concept album. There's a relationship. Jay-Z and Bay had a relationship, or in the story. Humanity and God had a relationship for the story. There's a fall. There's a breaking. There's a severing. The relationship ain't what it used to be. But there's redemption. It doesn't stay broke. It doesn't stay frayed. There's going to be a way to put this back together. And not only is it put back together, but it's restored to something better than what it was once before. So that's the overall point I was kind of looking at, like, hmm, all right, the Bible is lemonade, so okay, God, this really, this book is all about you restoring. I can look at the individual messages, yes, I can look at the individual characters and the individual heroes, but there is one main point that you're giving me, and that is you're all about restoring. You're all about bringing stuff back together. Let me ask this. How many of y'all know what the, the title Lemonade comes from? Let me raise your hand. Lemonade. Iced tea. I should have saw that one coming. Lemonade. And it comes from this. It's that old saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So let's make this a little more practical. Can we? When we gave God lemons, our fault and our sin, God made lemonade and gave us Jesus. That's one of the overall points of this. We gave God lemons, but God did not let it stay bitter. He did not let it stay sour. He changed that around and gave us lemonade. Let's get a little more personal. When you gave God yourself a lemon, God made lemonade out of you. Right now, I'm looking at about 200, 250 worth of cans of lemonade right now. Think about all of the bitterness, all of the brokenness, all of the ill will, stuff by thought, word, and deed that you gave to God and God changed you around. God changed your bitterness, my bitterness, changed my sin. Your sin, our sin, into something different, something sweet. That's how God's lemonade works. God will take all of your bad situations, all of our bad situations, and will give us something completely different. That's the overall point that this word is trying to give, is that I will take this messed up situation, this bad relationship, bad partners, this bad job, this bad money situation, these bullies at my school, 
these teachers that don't know that black lives matter. I'm going to take all of them, and I can make lemonade out of that bitterness. You know what my new prayer is? My new prayer right now? My new prayer is, you know what? God, please make lemonade. And I want you to think about this. God, please make lemonade. You know what? You ever pray sometimes and you get tired of going through all the stuff that, that is really weighing you down? You ever pray, you start, you start going to, uh, you know, with a circle prayer, they say pray specific prayers. But let me tell you, sometimes that gets exhausting. When I start circling everything, that's really working on my nerves. Anybody ever been in that situation? I'm praying, I'm listing laundry lists worth of stuff that's bothering me. God, my kids ain't acting right. God, this job really sucks. I don't get as paid as much as I want to. God, my car is breaking down. God, you know what? My family ain't really treat me the way they need to be treat me. God, you know what? I'm at, I'm at church, but I'm really not feeling fulfilled. God, you know what? My money's kind of funny. My, my change is strange. God, I need something. I need a breakthrough. You know what? Just say, God, make lemonade. Can I testify for a second? Can I testify? Okay, because I'm going to say this. Because I'm one of those, I don't always like to talk about myself. I don't always like to talk about stuff that's happening. I'll put out little hits and feelers every now and again, but I don't always say exactly everything that's happening. Can I tell you how God made lemonade out of my situation? That cool with you? I was going to tell it anyway, so at this point at least. <laughs> and if I go off, don't worry, I'm only going off for myself. Because yesterday when I was thinking about it, I started to get a little... I don't shout in church because y'all make fun of my two-step, but when I was at home and I was thinking about it, I said, you know what, God, you know what, I'm living in a house that you made lemonade out of. Because I remember all the years I was on mom's couch or in my own bedroom crying the blues. I need a place of my own, mom. I need somewhere I can live. I need somewhere, but I can't afford nothing. I can't even afford a cardboard box with electricity. I don't make enough at my job. I need a place. And I was crying the blues. And I'm like, you know what? It also stinks. How many of y'all are under the bitter taste of a student loan? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm like, God, I'm, I'm dealing with a student loan. And for all my kids going to college, wait for it. <laughs> Sally Mae will find you. And I was under the taste. I'm like, okay, God, you know what? I got all these situations going on, God. I, I want a place because, do you, for, for my bros, do you know how people look at you when you're 25 and you're still living at home? Where you live? Oh, I live in Bowie. Oh, I thought you said your family's in Bowie. Yeah, they live with me. The, the, the basement is like an apartment. <laughs> I, I, got, I got my own entrance through mom's front door. <laughs> but it was years of feeling, and, and it wasn't, the, most of the church folks were cool. It wasn't, it wasn't really y'all. It was really family I was catching it from. Oh, you never leave your mama. It's not like I'm not trying, dog. I'm working. <laughs> I'm, I'm working, but the job I'm working for is not, they can't pay me but so much. And I'm putting out my resume to places and places, and I'm getting turned down. Dog, I got turned away from the church. <laughs> my father buried outside, but I got turned away from a job. It's like, it was just nothing but lemons. And I kept on praying. I said, God, I need a place. I can't afford a place. And, and, and I, God, I just, I just, I just I, I'm also dealing with this student debt. God, please bless me with this student debt. And, and God started to make, he started to churn. I was squeezing all of my bitterness into a picture. I was squeezing out the stuff in the prayer. I was praying out. I was saying everything that was wrong, and God was still starting to churn. He was starting to churn. He was starting to add a little bit of water into it. Water doesn't exactly kill all the bitterness. It just tones it down a little bit. God don't always throw the sugar right into it first. God's going to tone it down a little bit. I need you to tone it down a little bit, Rick. I need you to tone it down because I need you to recognize first before I give you something. I need you to thank you for what I've already done. It's not a case where God is playing a game where God just wants to leave a carrot out for you to chase. I used to think that. 
I used to think that God was just leaving carrots out. Now, I'm trying to hamper, run, and catch whatever God has. It's not that case where God is doing that. God sometimes needs you to recognize what he's already done. Because if you don't recognize that, you won't appreciate the greater that he has for you. Recognize what I've done. I'm like, God, okay. And, and then it, it started to break. It started to break. I stopped, I stopped complaining about what I didn't have or what I really wanted. And then I started saying, okay, you know what? I remember it was, it was one, it was that, that, that one, that one winter when we had that little bit of a blizzard. It was, it was a bitter cold out. And I was like, God, you know what? I thank you that I'm sleeping inside of a bed in a house. It's not my name on the mortgage, God, but I'm sleeping in a bed. I can go upstairs and I can get something to eat. And I'm not saying thank you because I'm not like other people. I'm saying thank you because you've done this for me. No, I didn't have the place I wanted, but you know what? I didn't put on a little more weight than what I had first because I was at home and I was still fed and I was still comforted. I was okay. It's like, dude, thank you. God, if I never heard God before, God said that. God did tell me thanks. He said, thank you for finally recognizing. Now that you've recognized and been consistent with it, don't try to just thank him once and think that's a good, that's it. No. You can't just come just because of the altar that one time and think just because you came down that one time, everything didn't change. Nah, player. You got to put in the work for it. You got to put in the work. You got to keep on going back to God and say, God, you know what? Every day, I'm going to thank you. Every day, I'm going to thank you for what you've already done. Now, you're starting to put your own little water into the lemonade. You're starting to get some of that bitterness out now. So it's like, God, you know what, God? Thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for what's happened. Thank you for having a place to lay. Thank you for a mom who's not kicked me out because I have some friends that got kicked out. So I thank you that she let me stay here. You know, I thank you that even though I can't afford rent right now, she still allowed me to be here, that she understands the situation. God, I was struggling. I couldn't pay my mom. <laughs> Woo, all I got to do is treat my mom to Chick-fil-A. That's all I had. <laughs> God is good. Anyway, but, but God will bring you out of the situation. And then that's when God started to, to start to, to, to start. To, now he's starting to put a little more sugar into the lemonade because it's the sugar that kills the bitterness. That's why we sing, he's sweet, I know. <laughs> started to mix that up a little bit more. But then that's when I started getting that job working for Uncle Sam. I'm like, oh, cool, great. And right at the next time, me and my best friend, we said, hey, let's get an apartment. All right, I got rent, let's go. And then, and then, then you know, God blessed me because I start, we start getting bougie. We don't want to live over here. Let's live over here. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't want to share a bathroom. I want my own bathroom. Good, let's go to this place. But that's, that's, that's God blessing. Still have some bitterness. Still have some stuff. Still have my student loan. God knows I still had that student loan. Paying rent and a student loan at the same time. It, it's the devil. Student loan is that it is straight from the pit of hell. You don't believe me? Just watch. It is from hell. Still had that, right? Still had that going on. And, you know, had a year with my, my, my best friend. We had our own apartment, and then the lease was over. And then he went to his place, and then I had to go back to my place because I still couldn't completely swing on my own because I had my student loan. And mom... Thank, if you have a praying mother in your life, you better thank God for her. And let me tell you, it ain't always the prayers that they say with you. It ain't the prayers when they bring you down to the altar and cover you. That's a good one. But it's them late night prayers when they're crying. And they're laboring before the Lord too. It's them prayers that tugs on God's heartstrings. When your mother or your grandmother, your auntie, your uncle, your grandfather, whoever is praying, God, please see about my loved one. Those are the prayers. 
I remember mom was praying. I was telling my mom about my student loan. She's like, mom. She said, Rick, did you, did you do this? Did you, did you try? I said, mom, every single place you told me to try by getting my loan reduced, it's, it's not going to work. I, 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 I make too much to be able to get this assistance. In that, you make enough money, but yet you can't get no help for how they're trying to. <laughs> Sorry, I had to remember this is a family show. I was about to slip back into Rick, not Pastor Rick. But yes. <laughs> So you have like, man, I said I had no aid and I was, I, was, I was struggling. And let me tell you also a mark of a good mother, when she started to suffer with you, a mark of a good friend, when they suffer with you, when they suffer with you, because I'm stressed out about it. And for all of us that have student loans, man, there's plenty of nights. You, you ever just pull out the bill, look at it sometimes, and then just sit and be like. <laughs> you just stare at it. You, you, you can't believe. It's like. Doggone it, I done been paying on this bill for seven years, and, the, and, and my price then went up. How have I been paying for all this time, and my price go up? Normally, you pay on something, your price go down. And y'all want to vote for Trump? Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Had to throw that in there, my fault. Let me get back to the program. So either way, I'm like, she was stressing. She was stressing, she was stressing, she was stressing. And then I remember, I remember it was one day I was, I was working late shift at my job. So I, I actually had time to eat breakfast at home. I'm sitting there, and, and mom, we were sitting at the ta table talking. And she's walking on, she's on her way to the TV, and she just stopped. It was like God hit her. <laughs> now, my mother stopping in mid-pose like that kind of freaked me a little bit. So I'm like, what's wrong with her? She stopped mid-post. She said, I got an idea. I said, what? Because mom always has, she always have ideas. <laughs> they ain't always the best ideas, but, you know, I was living there, so I had to humor her. I had to listen. I said, I said well, what's your idea? She said, no, my idea is this. She said, um, I'm going to do this. My mother's house, nobody's living there. Nobody's lived there for the last two years. I said, okay. She said, I was going to rent it out, but the person that I was going to rent it to they stopped, they stopped communicating with me. They, they stopped messaging me. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, it sucks. Didn't, yeah. What you want me to do? She said, I got an idea. I said, what? She said, I'm going to sell the house to you. We got a little problem, huh? <laughs> I mean, I'm paying you rent now, but I can't afford a mortgage. She said, no, 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 hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. She said, the house already has part of a loan because of all the work I didn't put into it. Mom redid the house that was big, built in the 60s, and, and that, I'm going to say, oh, yeah, that, that joint nice. She made it nice. And then she said, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to have the loan be structured to not only take care of what I need, but to take care of your student loan. Okay, let's go. I was late to work that day. I came in singing. I ain't care. I'm like, hey, 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 amen. Uh, hey, let it be done. Uh, amen. That's what I'm talking about. I didn't want to move down to the country for nothing. I, I really did not like going down. The, I didn't like used to like my grandmother's house. But when I heard getting my student loan taken care of and get a place to look, God answered two prayers in one. And I'm not saying this to brag about myself or anything that I've done. I'm saying this to be a witness to you that God can turn your situation around every single time. This ain't for me. This ain't about me. It's about what God can do. And I'm here telling you, dude, that based on this, this is his witness, that I can turn your impossible situation. 
I can turn your impossible situations around every single time. I can restore what is broken in you. Understand my concept. It's here from Genesis to Revelation. I fix what is broke. But you want to drink this? The same no more. I challenge y'all just to add this to your prayer. Just, you know what? Thank him for what he's already done. Thank him for that concept. God, thank you for how you've already blessed me. Thank you for what you've already done. And for all the other stuff, God, make lemonade. That's just my challenge to y'all. Be bold enough to just ask God to make lemonade. He knows what it means now. Put this on Facebook, put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, whatever. God, make lemonade. That means take everything that is bitter, everything that is wrong, everything that is foul, everything that's against me. School, work, relational, whatever. God, take everything that's against me and make it something sweet. I veered off the kids somewhere along the line. I forgot where. But... That's it. This is why we're here. Because God has, you're here because God already did something for you. And got you here. But there's a challenge I also have for you too. I didn't want to tell my testimony at first because I didn't want people to think I'm trying to brag. But that was a trick of the enemy. He, he, didn't, he didn't want me to say it. Because he didn't want me to give glory to God. My, my, my challenge to you, to every single person, old school, new school, digital age, analog age, whatever. Young folks, old folks, vintage folks. My challenge to you is to be a witness. To tell your story about what God has already done. About how God already made lemonade out of your situation. Yeah. One of the things in the Bible that I always notice whenever Jesus healed somebody. Jesus would heal somebody. And then they would go off telling everybody. Jesus did this. Jesus did this. I got another challenge. I got two challenges. One for you just to tell your story, period. Well, three challenges. One, just pray God make lemonade. The second one, second challenge, write it down if you need to, to tell your story. Your third challenge, I want you to look around. We got a lot of room in this basket here for more lemons. I need you to bring more lemons to the house. Oh, I can get a whole clap on that one. I need you to invite people to church. And don't just invite them for the fourth Sunday. It's not guaranteed we're going to make it to next month. Can I be real? Any of them police shootings that happen, I don't mean to scare nobody, but I'm going to be up front with you. It could be any of us. Because they're shooting men, women, they, they, kids. 
Tomorrow's not promised. Don't try to wait just to get somebody here to fourth Sunday. Start next Sunday. Invite them to the table. Just invite them to the church. Pastor K preaches next Sunday. And Pastor K don't, I'm not saying this because she's my mom. I'm saying it because the truth. She don't never talk over anybody in her head. You can get what she's saying. Invite your friends, your family. Invite your people, your coworkers. Invite that person that's really ticking you off at work too. There's a reason why they're ticking them off because God made, God put that lemon in your life for you to be the sugar. Invite them to the house. We have a lot of room here. It's not her job to go around and to try to invite everyone she can. Her job is to minister when they get here. Our jobs, our jobs is to do the invitations. Kids, invite other kids to the church. All y'all dancing, I'm, I'm trying to see my kids. We got some prayer warriors over here too, if y'all ain't know. So I know y'all know the Lord. Invite your friends to your church. Tell your friends about God. And it doesn't mean you got to go through every single Bible scripture. No, no, you ain't got to do that. You don't have to go through every Bible scripture, quote everything from Genesis to Revelation. No, just, just tell them what God has done for you. Even if it's no more than, you know what, God woke me up and I'm here in class. That's enough. So you understand my challenges? God, make lemonade. Tell your story. Do not be ashamed of what God has done for you.